Hi, welcome to this podcast on how to write a perfect story. This is for any GCSE English language exam. Um, I'm looking at the EDUCAS exam board, but like I say, it can work for anyone. So we're going to look at how to do an interesting story and how to get a grade 9 or an A grade. So first of all, just a few things to go over. So remember, the story you will get will be an unseen title. So meaning you won't know what to write on. So you'll get a piece of paper like this. Um, on the AQA board you might get a picture, but for the EDUCASH you get four titles if we zoom in, and they're four random things. Certain things won't change, so up here will always be 24 marks for content and 16 for spelling, punctuation and grammar. Remember it's at 40. Remember you should write to aim about 400 to 50 to 600 words, that's the word count. Always plan your work, and then here we've got four titles. In this case, making a difference, the choice, write about a time when you're at a children's party, or write a story which begins with, I didn't know if I had the courage to do this. So four random titles, you have to write a story based on one of them. So let's talk about narrative writing first. So what is it? So it's written in the first person or third person. It's telling a story of a beginning, middle and end. It follows one character but often meets a number of characters. I've written realistic there, meaning you've only got 45 minutes or 50 minutes to write this, so you're really going to have only going to have one to three characters. You're not going to have time to talk about seven or eight characters. So you should have a dialogue in there, and something interesting should happen. And I'll talk about there's something interesting later on. Okay, so features of narrative writing, you need a plot, which is this is what happens, you need characters, the people or animals in the story, and you need a setting where the story or narrative takes place. So, a few things to go over. So, they can be true or fictitious, meaning you can use something from your own life, your, your own experience. The story's role is to interest or entertain the reader, so you will get marks for, in, for being interesting and entertaining an examiner. You're marked out of 40, 24 for content, so how interesting it is. So that's including planning, 16 for spelling, punctuation, accuracy and grammar. And rough mark, about to get a 4 or an old C, you need to get about 23 out of 40, 27 to get a 5 or above. So the word count is 450 to 600, like I said. However, the examiners have said that shorter than 450 words is, in their words, unlikely to score a high mark. And work longer than 600 is more likely to have mistakes. So that is directly from the examiners. So I would say go for 500 to 550 words. Remember, you've only got 45 to 50 minutes. So average handwriting, that's two and a half to three pages. If you're someone who does it on the computer with a, with a size 12 font, which is the normal font, it's about one and a half pages. So to get a perfect mark, you've got to be original and stay away from boring storylines. And I'll go over in a minute a few storylines that students tend to like. Okay, so deciding on your story. So remember, you're getting those four titles. However, we want to try to be as interesting and original as possible. So the first thing to decide to do, and you can decide this well before going into the exam, is the story going to be first or third person. So remember, first person is using I. So you are the character. Okay, so advantages of these are you could argue it's easier to write, it's good for personal accounts, makes the writing seem real, gives the writing a bit more pace, probably if you're... Uh, gives you a bit of confidence as well, writing I. Well, third person is he, she. So this gives the view of other characters, so you're not just focusing on the one character. And also it's a bit less predictable because you don't know if the main character survives. So if you're doing a character with I, you probably know the character's going to be okay because the character's still speaking at the end of your story. However, he or she leaves it up to question. I would say if you're in any doubt, go for first person because like I said it's a bit simpler and you, easier for you to use your own personal experiences. However remember I doesn't have to be mean you. So what I mean by that is say for example you're a 17 year old girl if you're using the first person in your story your main character doesn't have to be a 17 year old girl. So you could be anyone. So you could be like I say you could be a teenage girl. You could be a middle aged man. You could be a sort of slightly stranger character. So you could be a mysterious character. So like I say, any doubt, go for first person. Okay, next thing you can decide, and again you can decide this before going into the exam, is when does your story take place? So are you going to sell it in the past? 
Are you going to sell it in the present? Are you going to sell it in the future? So again, just a tip from me, from a spelling, punctuation and grammar point of view, I would say it's much easier to do it all in the past. Just because if you're someone who maybe gets confused with the tenses when you write, this will just eliminate that. So if everything's in the past, everything's in past tense, nice and simple. I said earlier on that you want to be interesting, you want to be original. So one way to avoid that is by avoiding all the ones, all the common stories that students um, use. Okay, so I've marked loads of GCSE papers and I'll tell you the common ones we have. So first one is fairy tales. So anything to do with girls walking through the, through the woods and someone following them, try to avoid that. Okay, but boys tend to do this one, so anything to do with Lord of the Rings or Harry Potter, I would tend to avoid that. Anything to do with going back in time, I would avoid that. Remember, you've only got 45 minutes, you've probably got about two pages, you haven't got time to do some big time travelling epic. So teenage pregnancy and drug abuse, okay, so we can lump these ones together, just because I don't think you should do anything that's too serious. It shouldn't be a massive, massive, horrible problem. Your story is about... You'll, you'll, you'll have a normality at the start, then you just have a slight problem, and by the end of the story you will solve that problem. So we don't need these big, heavy issues. Murder or blood, an examiner I saw write down, and I quote him, and he said that is immature. So murder and blood can be seen as immature. Obviously, if you do a fantastic piece of writing, then they probably won't say that. But bog standard, murder and blood, is a bit of an immature story. And please, 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 the biggest one, do not end your story. And you probably won't get marked down for this, but you will lose marks for originality. Please don't do a dream ending. Because basically the reason nine out of 10 students do this is because they don't know how to finish their story. So they just say, blah, 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 and then she woke up. So that's not good enough to get a high grade. So you need to be a bit more imaginative with your ending. Okay, a teacher tip from me then is I would try, and this is just my opinion, I would try to set your story over a short period of time, maybe in a f even a few minutes. So what I wouldn't do is not sell it over over days, weeks, months, years. Remember, again, you've only got 45 minutes, you've only got two pages. So it's going to be hard to do a story where you say 10 years later something else happened. So keep it nice and simple. You can get a grade 9 and a grade through all the stylistic devices you're going to use from your spelling, punctuation and grammar. So again, a tip from me, set it over a few minutes or an hour. Don't set it over a long period of time. Another tip from me is focus more on action than physical description. So I'll go into this more later, but don't spend a paragraph describing what someone's clothes are like or what someone's hair is like. We want to focus, we want the pace of the story to be quite quick. So focus on the character doing things as opposed to what they look like. So I would say when you're arranging or organising or planning your story, I would always say to myself three questions. One, is it fun to write? Two, will it surprise the examiner? And three, what can I do in two and a half pages? Okay, so remember, we always want to use these kind of things as well. So this is DeForest, which I'm sure you know about. If you want to look at any of these things, I've got them on separate PowerPoints and separate Word pages on BPC english.wordpress.com I'll put that on the video so you can see so this is the forest techniques okay you also want to use figurative language techniques so metaphor simile personification hyperbole onomatopoeia alliteration okay you also want to use sensory language so creating imagery in the reader's mind from using the senses makes them feel like they're in the scene so for example if you are in a railway station and you can say you can hear the trains you can hear the tannoy yeah makes the reader feel like they're there Okay, and also show, do, tell. So what I mean by this is showing creates mental images in the reader's mind. When readers get a clear picture, they are more engaged in the story. So for example, we wouldn't want a rubbish, a telling sentence, telling me something is Laura is angry. But showing me Laura is angry, well, how would we do that? Well, if we describe the body of Laura, that will tell us if someone's angry. So for example, blood rushing to her ears, that familiar throbbing pulse through her temples, her heart quickened and her pulse raised. So by describing the body, so rush to her ears, throbbing temples, heart quickens, we all know what that feeling feels like when we we're angry. It's much more imaginative, much more original, it's going to get you a much higher mark than just telling me I am angry. It's not good enough. So showing me is going to get us high marks. Okay, so for example, I could describe this girl, the way her nostrils are flaring, the way she's um, throwing the, the brush around. That is more interesting than just saying the girl was angry. 
Okay, so for example, let's see here that these are my questions. So, I've, the exam day comes, I go in the hall, my questions are the best Christmas I ever had, the surprise, write a story that begins with I didn't know if I had the courage to do this, the stranger. Straight away, the ones that come out to me are the surprise and the stranger. So what I'm going to do is think to myself, what's fun to write? What's going to surprise the examiner? What can you do in two and a half pages? Well, the first thing that comes out to me is the surprise. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put surprise in the middle of my page. I'm going to do a little spider diagram, and I'm going to think to myself, well, what are the stories that I could do that are about surprise? So all the different permutations. So I could have I win the lottery. I could have I open up my door and there's a baby on the doorstep. I could do a blind date. I could do I get a surprise Christmas present. I could do um, a puppy. I could do the surprises that I walk downstairs and there's an intruder in my house. Another surprise could be I have an embarrassing moment of some some kind. Another surprise is I turn up for my job and I'm sucked from my job. So again I'm going to say to me from those in the spider diagram from those things that are in the spider diagram what is going to be fun to write what is going to surprise the examiner and what can i do in two and a half pages so if i look at it again well what is going to surprise the examiner well the lottery probably isn't it's been done before baby on the doorstep done before christmas present boring puppy boring intruder could be quite interesting however it's probably been done before sat from the job done before okay so that leaves me of embarrassing moment and a Tinder date. So what would be fun to write? Well, if I'm, a, if I'm 16 to 18, maybe I know more about Tinder than some embarrassing moment. So is it going to surprise the examiner? Yeah, probably is going to surprise the examiner. Not too, too many people have done it. Is it fun to write? Yeah, probably would find it fun to write. It's something, that, something I may be interested in. Could I do it in two and a half pages? Yeah, I could do it in two and a half pages. Okay, so I've decided on the Tinder one. Okay, again, I'm going to open up the page and I'm going to do another spider diagram. And you should do this with your one, so use the same method as me. And I'm going to put Tinder date in the middle. And again, I'm going to do all the different permutations, all the different things that could happen on my Tinder date. So, first one could be, it's just a normal date. Okay, now another one could be, I turn up for this blind date and it's an ex-boyfriend playing a trick on me. Um, next one could be, it could be someone I know. It could be that I get stood up on the Tinder date. It could be that I turn up and the guy is drunk. It could be a catfish, meaning it's someone pretending to be someone else. Maybe the other Tinder date, could, the guy could be very short or very, very tall. Okay, again, I'm going to say to myself, what's going to be fun to write? What's going to surprise the examiner? What can I do in two and a half pages? Okay, well, fun to write. Normal date, probably not going to be fun to write. Ex-boyfriend, not going to be fun to write. Drunk not going to be fun to write too short too tall a bit shallow so maybe not too fun to write the catfish one could be fun to write maybe um someone i know could be fun to write so then i need to make a decision which one i have can i have more fun with which one can i do two pages i'm going to go for the catfish one i'm going to go for i want to write a story about some someone turns up and they're pretending to be someone else and they're not structure of a story what do we need to do for, for a structure so a common story will have the following things a beginning setting the scene and introducing the characters, development, getting to know characters a bit more, maybe another character is introduced. Then the problem, something happens to complicate the lives of the characters, okay? So in my, in this instance with my Tinder one, I'm gonna be, the problem is that the person turns up and it's not the real person. Climax, a decisive moment is reached, matters come to a head, suspense is high. And then my ending is matters are resolved and some sort of satisfactory end is reached. So if we look at, and there we go, so we can almost look at it as, as that kind of way. So pause the video if you want to pause it. If we think of a James Bond film, so everyone has seen James Bond films probably, okay? Hopefully you have, okay? So if we think about a James Bond film, they always have the same structure, and they follow the structure that we have just looked at. So if we look at the structure, looking at a James Bond film, okay? So the beginning of a James Bond film is James Bond is playing poker in a luxury casino somewhere very exotic. The development could be we meet a few of the characters in London and he's called back to London and we meet some other people like Miss Moneypenny or his boss. Then the problem would be of a James Bond film, an evil genius is threatening to take over the world. The climax would be James Bond saves the world and the ending is James Bond sells into, off into the distance with the James Bond girl or his love interest in the film. So all the way 
It's always the same. So beginning, development, problem, climax, ending always stays the same. And your story will probably follow the same pattern. Again, if we look at another one, let's look at Home Alone. Nearly everyone's probably seen Home Alone, haven't they? Okay, so the beginning would be meeting the characters and the house as they pack for a holiday. Development is we get to know the characters a bit more. Kevin is told off and sent to bed. The problem of Home Alone is that he is left home alone. They go on holiday without him. And also there's burglars introduced. The climax is that Kevin defeats the burglars and the ending is the family come home and are reunited. So remember, a story is always pretty much the same. So it starts off at a nice normal level, then there's a problem, then the probe is overcome and then it goes back to that normality. Okay, so I would also do this to your main character, even though you might use your character's eye, think to, think to yourself these questions and it'd be good to write these down before you go into the exam. So is your character going to be male or female? How old are they? What do they look like? What's their personality like? What do they do for work? What do they do in their spare time? Do they have a family? So if you ask yourself these questions and answer these questions about your character, then it's probably going to make you more interested in them, but also it's going to make them more convincing and a more rounded character for the examiner. So here's the Tinder story, the A grade one, the grade nine one we're looking at. I would say this is probably about two paragraphs more than you have to do. So don't worry if it looks too scary. I would say you could wear the paragraph... Um, where the person is saying Chloe towards the bottom of the page. If you sort of delete the rest of that to the bottom, I would say that's how much you um, how it would have to write. So let's read through it, the surprise. What the hell was I thinking? Just the thought of doing the awkward hello made me want to cringe. I typed in my passcode and looked at his profile for the millionth time. He looked normal, I guess. The aroma of fatty fast food wafted over me as the speaker system screamed his train's arrival. My pulse raced and my legs felt heavy. Slipping from my fingers, the balloon floated skyward rapidly towards the enormous clock. I knew what to blame for this. Tinder. Joining in the summer, it was all swipe, swipe and swipe. The time had come, my friends had told me, to find the one. After scrolling through thousands of self-indulgent selfies, I picked him. His brown hair shone like glistening chocolate and he had kind, warm eyes. He also had a dog. So he couldn't be too bad, could he? It was his idea to carry a pink balloon so we could recognise each other amid the clatter, chaos and commuters of Waterloo. He should have been here by now. When was the next train home? My train app told me it was in five minutes. Checking my watch for the gazillionth time, my face drained of colour as the minute hand struck five. We'd agreed to meet at noon. It was around that time when it went wrong. It all happened so quickly. It wasn't really my fault, it was all just so weird. In the distance towards the ticket machine, I could see a pink balloon bobbing along the chattering crowd. Gulp. You can do this, I told myself. No, you can't, came a voice from somewhere inside my head. Limping along slowly, the body holding the balloon came into focus like a lion in a hunter's gun. Slowly, very slowly, my eyes began to zoom in on a truly sick sight. It wasn't the boy in the photo. Did I just say boy? It was a man, an old man, an old bearded repulsive man. Suddenly he picked up his pace and walked towards me. I felt like I was the balloon he was holding and I was about to burst with a scream at any moment. I froze. The sensation of wanting to run away was so strong but I was a fly stuck in a gigantic cobweb. Moving closer I noticed he sported a rat-like ponytail with food-stained sweaty clothes. What the hell was going on? Catfish, I thought. My head ached and my stomach rumbled loudly. For goodness sake, Chloe, get a grip. I was just being melodramatic. He was probably nothing to do with me and just happened to have a balloon. It was probably for a cute little granddaughter. I needed to stop being so bloody stupid. Suddenly, I felt a tap on my shoulder. What happened to your balloon? The old man asked, looking up. You can touch mine if you want. Freak! I screamed louder than I'd ever screamed in my life. I pulled away from him and stumbled as I ran towards my platform. He shouted after me, but I didn't look back. I just sprinted and sprinted. I crashed into some people, knocking a boy over. I didn't care. Whistling loudly, the guard who was closing the doors were ushering the final people on board. Swinging the door open with an extravagant flourish, like a cowboy about to swagger into a western, I leapt on board. As the train pulled away, I opened my emergency mini bottle of whiskey and took a huge swig. Chloe! I screeched so loudly the train jumped off the tracks. Tapping on the window, tapping on the, window the boy I knocked over was waving me from the platform and pointing towards his grazed hand. He was holding a balloon. A pink balloon. As the train picked up his pace and he got smaller and smaller, I saw him shake his phone violently towards me. To be fair, a match me was the least I deserved. That was the whole awful, horrible story, and I knew what to blame. Tinder. So hopefully you got the, the idea there. So if we look at our structure, my first sentence was, what the hell was I thinking? My beginning was an 18-year-old girl waiting at Waterloo for someone, to so a Tinder date. 
She's nervous, she's holding a balloon. We don't really know why she's holding the balloon. Then the middle is, um, it's a catfish, a guy she doesn't know. She thinks that's the date, it's an old guy. She, you describe her appearance, he's holding a balloon. So hopefully you got the idea. Um, she was holding the balloon to meet the date. However, the old man just had a, by chance, by coincidence, he had a balloon. Then my dialogue, my climax was she runs away from the old man and gets on the train. And then my ending, which is a bit of a twist ending, is that the old man wasn't her date. The, uh, the boy she knocked over was actually her date. And it ends with her going off on the train and him unmatching her. So my story would be like this, so the one we just said. So beginning is she's waiting at the train. Development is we learn it's a Tinder date. The problem is it's not the person she's expecting. The climax is she runs away from the old man. And the twist ending is she actually knocked over the boy and he unmatches her. Okay, so the opening of my story then. So... In any story you write, you want a gripping opening to grab the reader's attention. You also want to induce the main character, describe the setting and build the mood and temper, mood and atmosphere to draw the reader in. So you need to hook in the reader. So lots of different ways you can have opening sentences, but we want to grab the reader straight away. So the first way is to use dialogue, so the character speaking. Hands in the air, this is a stick up, he hollered roughly. You could also use a statement. I never wanted a girlfriend, or this was the worst day of my life. Action. Without a moment's hesitation, she lifted the revolver and fired to get straight into it. Description of a person. Will Hunting looked ordinary for someone who just solved one of the world's most difficult maths problems. Okay. A description of time. As the clock struck 12, it echoed around the hall. Or you could do what I did, using a rhetorical question to get the reader involved, almost like you're speaking directly to the reader. What the hell was I thinking? So the reader automatically is thinking, oh, something has happened. And there you go, all the ones you can have. So feel free to pause. On the right-hand side is the um, the Times newspaper did um, a survey, the 10 best lines, opening lines of fiction. So if you want to pause, have a look at that. Okay, so looking at the opening paragraph that I did, Okay, there you go again. So if we look at the opening paragraph, one thing I would say is it's quite big for an opening paragraph. Um, there are sort of eight, eight or nine sentences, so you probably want to do it as long. However, if we analyse the opening paragraph in detail, there's lots that we can see in there. So for example, figurative language. Earlier on I said we want to use the forest, we want to use figurative language. Well, have we used it in the opening paragraph? Not loads and loads, but we have used it a bit. So we've used a rhetorical question at the start. A millionth time we used hyperbole. Fatty fast food, we've used alliteration. Speaker system scream. So again, that's alliteration, but it's also personification, isn't it? So we're saying the train, something that can't do a human emotion, we're saying the train literally scream like a person. So all of this stuff is trying to get an image into the reader's mind, making it more descriptive, more interesting for the reader. Okay, again, if we look at the opening three paragraphs, we've got loads of stuff in there. Hyperbole, alliteration, personification, power of three, similes, rhetorical questions again, hyperbole, onomatopoeia. So we've got loads of stuff in the first three paragraphs. So you should, when you're using figurative language or any technique, don't just use it in one bit. So if we look at the whole document, we haven't got it loads and loads and loads. However, we've got it pretty consistently all the way through. So it's all the stuff in blue. So that's the kind of thing you should hopefully go for. Okay, let's look at sensory language. Did we get the senses in the first paragraph? Did we try to put an image in the reader's mind so they feel they were there? Yeah, well, we did. So we did. Everyone knows what it's like to type in the iPhone, so we can imagine that. The aroma of fatty fast food. We've always we've all been to like a pub or somewhere where it's really like far, fatty food, greasy food. We can imagine what it smelt like at the train station. Again, we can all, we've all been in the train station. We know what the public address system sounds like. And also, pulse raced. My legs felt heavy. We know that feeling of legs feeling heavy and your pulse racing when you're tired or when you're nervous. Okay, again, like figurative language, we've not used sensory language all the way through, but we've used it consistently consistently throughout the story, so all the way through the reader can imagine what it feels like, what it sounds like, what it tastes like, what it smells like in the story. Okay, so show, don't tell. So, am I doing boring sentences, telling the reader something, or am I giving the reader subtle clues about what's going on? Well... We, wanted, we don't want to give the details of all the plots straight away. We want to make the reader do a bit of work, work, work out what's going on. So we look at the first document again. First of all, can we have we shown the reader what's going on? We've got little clues that there's, we're, we're waiting for a date, aren't we? So we've got typed in the passcode and looked at his profile for the million times. So there's a clue maybe we're looking at a date. 
So it also says her pulse race and her legs felt nervy. So that's showing the reader that she's nervous for some reason. Even the slipping from the fingers, but she letting her go of a balloon. We've got no real idea at this stage what the balloon is about. We find out later it's that she's agreed to meet her date and they both carry balloons so they can spot each other. But at this stage, it's a little bit of a mystery. Why has she got the balloon? It's only right at the end where we say, I knew what to blame for this Tinder. So it's only right at the end of the paragraph where we tell the reader what's going on. And again... Am I showing the reader where I am? Am I saying straight away I'm at a train station? No, not straight away. So it does say trains of arrival, so we know we're at a train station. But speaker system screamed. Yeah, fatty food. Again, we're showing the reader. We're giving clues where we are. We're not telling them where we are straight away. Okay, sentence starters. So you're not going to get a high grade if you just start every sentence in the whole story with the, a, in, yeah, as. We want to try and do different things. So one is you can start with an adverb, so a word ending in ly, describing a verb. So we've not just started with John picked up the package, we've put carefully, comma. So that's shown how John picked up the package, a lot more descriptive. We could start with a verb ending in ing, so moaning. So this gives us action, doesn't it? So sprinting, running, crossing, climbing. That sort of thing gets us right into the action. Okay, start of an adjective, a lot more descriptive. So we're just saying I couldn't move. So you couldn't move for maybe loads of reasons. Couldn't move because you were tired. Couldn't move because you couldn't be bothered. Shocked, I couldn't move. It tells us there's a reason why this person can't move. Again, more descriptive. You could start with two adjectives, bored and exasperated, comma. Or you could start with a simile. So this is not something you would do all the time. Maybe once in your whole story, as loud as a lion, I shouted to my mate. Obviously, you come up with a better simile as loud as a lion. Again, you're going to get higher marks for doing interesting similes and not boring ones like that. Again, I didn't do it too much through my first paragraph. Again, I just want to show the examiner I can do it. I don't want to knock him or her over the head with it all the way through. So, I did an interesting sentence start. I said, what the hell was I thinking? So, using a question as a sentence start, that's interesting. And again, I did slipping from my fingers. So, using a word ending in ing, so a verb. So, again, get us right into the action. Then, all the way through, again, I've used interesting sentence starters all the way through. So, joining, checking, limping, slowly. Again, a rhetorical question, whistling, swinging, tapping. So all the way through, I'm trying to get the reader involved in the story, make the writing seem quite quick, make the reader seem like they're in the middle of the action. You will also get good grades for changing the lengths of your sentences. So here's just a really um, interesting um, image where if you just read it, it sounds very boring. This, list, this sentence has five words. Here are five more words. Five more sentences are fine. This sounds like so it sounds very robotic very robotic so if you change the length of your sentences it's much more interesting for the reader if you do long sentences that's going to describe the setting if you do quick if you do short sentences it quickens up the pace so if you look at my first paragraph i've sort of got a mixture so i've got i've started a really really short sentence i've ended with really short sentences if you use a short sentence well it gives emphasis to that so what the hell was i thinking i want emphasis to my first sentence and my last sentence is i knew what to blame for this tinder i want emphasis on that because it's a really powerful sentence gets the reader involved straight away again all the way through my yellow are short sentences my green are long sentences so i've changed them up all the way through consistently done long sentences consistently done short sentences again it's going to impress the examiner Okay. So when I wanted to put attention on a sentence, I've made it a short sentence. So for example, when I'm telling the reader my twist at the end, that the, the teenage boy is really the day, I put he was holding a balloon, a pink one, short sentences, draw the, draw the fact, draw the attention to the fact that it's the boy. Again, when I'm describing the, the guy who was a catfish, short sentences, did I just say boy? It was a man, an old man, an old beardy repulsive man. All short sentences, all quicken up the pace of the writing, make it interesting paragraph lengths try to make them shorter and longer as well so if you look at my top I've got three that are quite similar but then I've got um, quite a big paragraph in my yellow quite short sense paragraphs in my green again try to mix up the paragraph lengths again that's going to impress the examiner also one did I think I did with the structure of my story was that if you look at it I start I end my first paragraph with I knew what to blame tinder and then I end it with I knew what to blame for this tinder so it makes it quite circular so it means we're almost ending as we were starting Okay, look, so in the yellow, I knew what to blame. At the bottom, I knew what to blame for this Tinder. Okay, development, just getting to the characters a bit more. So really, this is just getting to know the teenage girl more, getting to know her personality a bit more, getting a bit of history about the Tinder thing. Okay, we've also, again, we're using the devices, so clatter, chaos, and commuters of Waterloo. We're using alliteration, we're using para-free. So problem, okay, a lot of people struggle with this because 
they do a huge problem. They do something like we're going back in time or someone's died or something like that. Your problem in your story should be small and interesting. Again, you've only got two pages, you've only got 45 minutes. So keep it small, but interesting. So for example, in my one, the girl was waiting for a blind date. That's my start, okay? What I then haven't done is I haven't said that the guy has been crashed, the train's crashed into him. I've not said that she's tried to mug her. I've not said that the guy was caught by the police. All I've done is, my small little problem is that the date is not the person she expecting. So, even though it doesn't sound like the biggest thing in the world, it is still interesting and I can still talk a lot about it. I try to build attention as much as I can in that. Okay, then the climax is, how are you gonna solve the problem? Well, in this case, it's going to be that the girl's going to run away from the man because um, she doesn't like the look of him. And again, what I said earlier on, more action than physical description. So we can describe the man a bit, but we want to keep the story, the pace of the story up. So just describe the action, the girl running away, jumping onto the train. And if you look at this now, I've, lo I've used lots of verbs, haven't I? Scream, pull, stumble, shouted, sprinted, crashed, ushering, swagger, pulled, open, leapt, swinging. All of these describing the action using verbs I'm describing the action I'm not describing what someone looks like all this quickens the pace up of the story makes it a lot more interesting for the reader and the ending so how am I going to tie it all together well the ending is the final impression the reader has of your writing your ending should be included in your plan think about tone happy sad or funny so if you've done a piece let's just say if we do the tinder date one that is like kind of funny all the way through don't end it in a really sad way try to stick to the tone if it's been happy all the way through try to make it happy if it's been sad all the way through don't just tack on a really really happy ending so try to stick with the tone and mood so craft your final sentence carefully remember this is the last bit of your writing an examiner will read do not say it was a dream. Earlier on, do you remember I said, don't say it was a dream. It's a really lazy ending. It's an ending for people who don't know how to end their story. Okay, so there are different kinds of story endings. So one is a closed ending when all the threads are neatly tied. So we can think about that James Bond example. So at the end, he's killed the baddie, everyone's okay. We could have an open ending. So this is when a story fails to provide satisfying enclosure and leaves the reader with question gaps they need to fill in. So, for example, if anyone has seen Inception, we don't know if it's real or if it's a dream, and we're not told that. Okay, So an open ending is something where we're not really told the ending. It's up for us to decide. And then a twist ending is when a story takes an unexpected turn. So we can include the story we looked at now. We can look at the Tinder story as one that takes an unexpected turn. So if we look at the ending again, okay, twist ending when a story takes the next step. What we were expecting, well in this story, when she runs away from the guy, the old man, we probably thought that was it, she's gonna get on the train as well. However, the twist is actually that the old man was never the date at all, it was the real person she was waiting for, however, he was just a little bit late, okay? Okay, again, last sentence is, that was the whole awful, horrible story, yeah, so I've made it sound like it was a really bad thing in her life, but then the main thing is, I knew what to blame Tinder. So it ends with how it starts. We started with the, I knew what to blame Tinder, it ends with how it starts, it makes the writing circular, makes it a more complete piece. Okay, again, at the top, I knew what to blame, at the bottom, I knew what to blame Tinder. Short sentence as well, I've also used a colon, so that's gonna up my spelling punctuation and grammar grade. Big thing is is dialogue tags. So what I mean by this, okay, is we don't want you to say said all the way through. Okay, so there's low. These words here are words that you can use. So when you are doing dialogue, the characters speaking to each other, we don't want he said, she said, he said. We could use more interesting ones. Yeah, responded, coughed, whispered, scream, hollered, shouted. It makes it different than using said, but it also tells us how the character is thinking. And feeling. So, for example, if the character is whispering something, we know it's a secret or something that she doesn't want to overhear. If we say chuckled, it means the person's laughing. Yeah. So this is a lot more descriptive, more, much more interesting than saying said. I haven't actually got a lot of dialogue in mine, so the ones I've used are told, asked, scream. Okay. We don't want your story should, to look like a script. So what I mean by that is we don't want half a page of just literally one line, one line, one line, where it's people speaking to each other. So we want to use dialogue, but not too much. So in my case, I've only used it four or five times. I think that's probably quite a good one to follow. So what do I mean by dialogue? So dialogue is a conversation between two or more people in a film, book or play. So what are the rules for punctuation? So remember, we need really high spelling, punctuation and grammar marks if we want to do it really well. There's a few rules we've got to follow. So one, all dialogue must be contained in quick quotation marks. Yeah, so all the actual um, dialogue the character is saying is in these red quotation marks. 
Number two, before the end of the quotation marks, you must punctuate. Okay, so before, so it says let's not, and we've got a comma. Okay, so before the quotation marks end, we need some kind of punctuation. We just don't leave it blank. Okay, last one was a comma because the girl said something. This time the person is shouting, so we're going to have an exclamation mark. Yeah, before the quotation marks end. Okay, new speaker, new line. So that means let's put another shrimp on the barbie. Lloyd shouted, but let's not the girl said. So because the girl has said something, we drop a line. Number four, include who said and what and how. So for example, let's put another shrimp on the barbie. Lloyd shouted. So I'm telling you who is speaking and how he said it. And then the girl, we've just put said. Okay, so it's telling me who is saying it and how they're saying it. I put a little asterisk on the screen just to say, if it's really, really obvious who is saying it, you don't literally have to say, Lloyd said, Lloyd said, Lloyd said, Lloyd said. So not every time, but just make sure it's very clear for the person reading it. Okay, last one. A quoted sentence must begin with a capital letter. So for example, man, you are one pathetic loser. The man always has to have a capital. So the first word always has to have a capital. On um, bbcenglish.wordpress.com, there is this worksheet here if you want to print it off or you can just look on the screen now. Okay, so there's the, the golden rules. And also on BBC English, um, there are, is a little um, worksheet with answers on the website. So if you want to have a go at that, have a go at that. So just remember then, for a great grade, use ambitious vocab, vary sentence structure and length, use the five sentences to describe, describe the setting, show what the characters are like using dialogue, keep the sense of the character and tone throughout. So like I said earlier on, if it's a happy piece all the way through, be happy at the end. If it's a sarcastic piece all the way through, be sarcastic. Don't be sad, 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 and in the last sentence, be the most happiest person ever. Describe the atmosphere and special techniques such as similes, metaphors, so anything to do with deforest, show, not tell, figurative language. That's it. Um, hopefully that's been of good use to you.